Hello, welcome back. We are Four Struggling Filmmakers. My name's Emma. Joined with me is Jimmy. Hello. James. Hello. And Noah. Hi there. Hello. So, do we have any recommendations to begin with? Once again, I'm, I'm back at it, recommending uh, films from my Alphabet Month, uh, as I've plugged the past two episodes. Uh, the film that I'm going to be recommending today is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the one that came out in the 70s. I'm pr is it 78, Jimmy? Do you know? Oh, well, I've got the Blu-ray, hold on. <laughs> Ow! Uh... <laughs> 1978, yes. Yay. 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 Got there in the end. Is that with Donald Sutherland? It is, yeah. yeah. Donald Sutherland, oh, yeah, yeah. Jeff Goldblum, um, Leonard Nimoy for a little bit as well. It's a very interesting horror film that really plays on the sense of like paranoia and uh, sus suspense all throughout the entire film. Um, it, is, it is a bit goofy. Uh, because that a lot of the uh, elements that are goofy are taken from the original. Uh, but I think it works quite well here uh, to a decent degree. So uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a good watch. And it'll it's got a really good ending as well. So Look out for Kevin McCarthy. The main character from the original film is in this film for two seconds. If you've just watched it, James, he's the guy who's like running down the street saying, they'll get you too. And then I think he gets hit by a car and dies. I've now taken on James's persona of recommending tv sh shows instead of no, well, you're, it's mine, Emma. <laughs> um, i'm gonna go with the netflix series snowpiercer i believe a couple of episodes ago we mentioned the film well no one mentioned the film snowpiercer but i haven't seen the film but the tv series i'm really enjoying it the adverts don't necessarily look amazing i think they look a bit sci-fi cringy but it's actually really really good um it's basically just about the world that is uninhabitable outside of this train and it just goes around the world and everything that sort of happens on this train. In the second series, it's got Sean Bean in it. And yeah, I think it's really good. And if you're looking for something to sit and watch, highly recommend. I also have a film recommendation. Oh? Uh -huh. Mine is free to watch. Uh, it's on YouTube, which is a sign of its quality. It's Day of Anger, 1968, uh, Western, Spaghetti Western, starring Lee Van Cleef and Giuliano Gemma, who is uh, one of my beloved Italian actors. Really solid, uh, like, student tutor Western tale, but it actually has a character arc, unlike just like every other Spaghetti Western. Uh, surprisingly solid, nice set pieces, good story, worth a watch. Just uh, type in Day of Anger on YouTube. Really nice recommendations if you're looking for something to watch, as always. But for this, stay with us. Don't forget to subscribe, because today, what are we talking about, James? We are, in celebration of St. Patrick's Day, talking about some Irish cinema. So some Irish films, films set in Ireland, you know, you know the country. So uh, I'll guess I'll guess I'll kick us off for uh, Irish Week. Uh, the, the film I've chosen is Sing Street. Uh, it's a 2016, uh, it's a musical comedy film. Uh, it's directed by John Carney, uh, produced by the Weinstein Company, but we don't need to talk about that. The whole film revolves around uh, this boy who gets transferred to a new school. It's, it's very, like, you, you've kind of seen this kind of film before. He gets transferred to a new school and then he's a bit of an outcast and then he rises through the ranks and becomes popular. The, the way it's done in this film, though, is really, really charming because uh, it's set in it's 1980s uh, Ireland and he he is quite he's kind of like the posh boy and then he's going to like this budget school because his parents are in the midst of the divorce when they when he gets there uh like he's like immediately outcast like there's this bully who i'll talk about in a bit um and he like abuses him and stuff there's the uh teachers because it's a catholic school they're very strict about like the way things are run and stuff um uh, but he has a love for music him and his brother specifically and from that, he uses it to kind of ask out a girl that he sees just out of random. There's things in this film that are like questionable at best, um, but you can kind of go with it because it's a, it's a fun, enjoyable ride to go through. He immediately goes up and it's like, hey, I'm in a band. Do you want to be in our music video? And then it's the whole thing is like, she's like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And he doesn't have a band and he has to like scrounge one up out of like the few people he know to make a make a music video based on like sort of like the 80s 
you know, aha and Spandau Ballet, that sort of vibe. Um, and it's, it's done really well for the most part. The, the brother in the film is played by Jack Raynor. He, has, he hasn't really been in a lot. I, I saw him in this first and I thought he was fantastic. I thought this, this guy is probably going to do some really great stuff. And then he found out he, he ended up being in Transformers 4 and he's very good in that. So uh, it's unfortunate, but if you, you want to see a good performance by him, this is it because he, he really puts it all into it. And a lot of the, the best relationships in the film, because it's, it's all about like friendship and learning who, who you want to be in life. But it's, it's really a story about like brotherhood. And it's sort of like an underlying theme in the film that like, kind of like raises head right towards the end. And it's really, really impactful the way that it's done. Because the brother is sort of like, he's this stoner loser dropout. And he's he wants to be like a, a great musician, but his time has passed. He's kind of missed that window of opportunity. And he's using his little brother to kind of fuel his dream. Of like you can go off and do this because i didn't have the chance to there's a great scene where their their parents have an argument because as i said they're in the midst of the divorce they're in a big row um and they're they're all in a, one room together and they start listening to music to drown out all of the uh the arguments going on behind them i think that's really beautiful the way it's done the way that these relationships are done so maturely but like funny as well because this this film a lot of its charm comes from the fact that it is irish because there's there's scenes where you expect it to be like um a, a tad tropey and like this film does dabble in tropes but the way that it's done is like one thing that sticks in the mind where it's revealed that the girl that he likes is sort of in a relationship with this older guy and he picks picks her up in a car and you expect him to like drive away and him left in the dirt um but she gets in the car the car just about drives away, it stalls, and he has to reverse out and <laughs> drives away. <laughs> and it, there's, there's some really good tiny character moments throughout that are really good. There's this one guy who's part of the band and he's like obsessed with rabbits. So like every so often in the scene where you see they're rehearsing, there's like rabbits just walking around on the floor. Him and his brother like to watch Top of the Pops because this was back in the 80s when that was like the big thing. Whenever there's like a new music video, they use that as inspiration for their next one that they're going to do. So that, as I said, they go from Aha to Spando Ballet to like various different styles of music and different bands and all their costumes change throughout. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, um, I, I wrote down it's tropey, but charming. It's, it's got the right amount of cheese to it as well. Yeah. It's, it does dabble in stuff that I'm just sort of like, do you really need to do it this way? But it's, it's never at a detriment to the film too much. Like it, the music itself, like the songs that they make and sing are a bit iffy. Like they feel a bit too modern for like an 80s set film. Like the first one's really good. The Riddle or the Model, it's called, is really good for what they're trying to do. But uh, the rest of the music is less so. And there's also like very little conflict in the film. And the, the ending's a bit weird. Yeah, the ending was just sort of like, they do the gig and then they go off on a boat. And then it's like... It's like, he's 15 yeah. years old and he's gonna... And his brother's like, yeah, have fun in London. Yeah, it's, it's it's a bit of a strange ending, but it's like it's it's uplifting in a way. Like I can see what they were trying to do. Is this a film which is like a drama that has music in it? Is it every spoken word of dialogue is part of a song? It's not that kind of musical. Where does it fit? It is it is a film with music in it. And music is a very big part of this film, whether um, in its themes um, or directly of how they play it. It's a drama comedy with musical but with, with songs in it basically i get you i get you yeah. so I, all, I, all, the song, all the songs are diegetic aside from like maybe one um, I, but I, I prefer it that way i yeah. i don't know about you guys but most most of the time a lot of the song scenes are set during them filming their music videos that they're making um so it's, it's all it's all done in universe and it doesn't feel like and then we stop to have a song but yeah. like that happens once and that's just sort of like a, not necessarily dream sequence, but this guy's like sort of daydreaming as he's doing a uh, rehearsal and oh, then they go to like this big thing. And it really feels like a, a modern music video. So it, it's it's all right, but it kind of stands out like when it appears. Like I'm not really sure if I like it or not because um, it, it works quite nicely. It's a cute moment, but it's also sort of like, we must stop the film now. Here is a music video sequence. Stop it again. Here's the rest. It's a very, very casual watch. Like it does deal with some themes, not necessarily head on. Like there's some moments where it does get, like that they do touch on some serious subjects, but they kind of do it in a way where it's not so in your face and aggressive yeah. about it. I um, have a really good point to go with that. It's like mm -hmm. when when she's talking about her father, 
and she goes she just goes oh I don't know why he picked me because my mum's more beautiful and it's like something such a serious topic like that and it's only like implied and like put as an aside all these yeah. serious topics are just like casual throwaway comments I thought well, that yeah and, it, and an- another one that springs to mind for me is uh, the character of uh, Barry the bully and like because like, init- initially he he turns up and you just saw like oh here he is he's, he's the guy that's going to cause this kid grief and he does for like half the film and then you can kind of see throughout those interactions that like there's probably a little bit more at play here and then towards the end he's sort of like brought into the band as sort of like their bouncer yeah um, and it's, it's 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 a really nice moment because you can kind of see like he doesn't want to be like this it's just like he's a product of his his environment he's got like a rough upbringing that's not directly shown but his dad's a bit of a dickhead, really. Like, this film, I think, embodies the saying, you're making the best out of a bad situation. And there's a brilliant quote um, from uh, Rafina that when they're shooting the music video, and she has to, like, jump into the sea. And then they were all like, oh, you know, just jump down here and then hide, and it was going to look badly. So she j- runs and actually jumps into the sea. And then she's like, oh, guys, I can't swim. Can someone come in and rescue me? <laughs> and they're all like, why Why did you jump in if you can't swim? And she goes, you can never do things by halves. And I thought, what a great quote. The whole yeah. film is literally this making the best out of a bad situation. So, so to summarise, Sing Street is a really uh, feel-good film. You know, it's tropey but charming. Uh, and if, if you want a nice musical comedy drama to watch, this is definitely one that is will, will tick, tick what you fancy and uh, be good. Yeah. Watch it. Uh, thanks, James. I'm sort of going to change the mood a bit for my film. Uh, my film is called Calvary. So it's a film written and directed by John Michael McDonough. He's, old, he's the older brother of Martin McDonough from uh, the director who did In Bruges and Three, uh, for, is it three Billboards Outside of In Missouri, that film. So he's the older one. And this is an Irish film, obviously. It's all about Father James. Father James played by the brilliant Brendan Gleeson in this. And in the opening scene, someone's confessing to him and they tell him that they're, they're going to kill him in a week because whoever it is, we don't know, but was sexually abused by a priest when they were a child and they want to act revenge. It, it isn't Father James that's done it, but because he's a good priest, I think the motive is that he'll do it to him because just to get back at priesthood. Basically, throughout that whole week, uh, Father James goes about his business as a priest, and his daughter arrives quite early on, played by Kelly O'Reilly. She has just attempted suicide. She lives in London, and she's come to this little town where it's a very small town, and she's just come back to Ireland to see her dad. She's attempted suicide because you find out that uh, Father James's ex-partner, wife, uh, has died, so that's her mum. And she's quite suicidal. She's of it, and um, find out that he sort of a, not kind of abandoned her for the for the church. We also find out quite a lot about the sort of town, and it's kind of ends up being like kind of like a mystery film in some ways. But it's got quite a lot of themes about sort of forgiveness, your sins in life. It's got quite a dry very dark sort of sense of humour, kind of similar to In Bruges in some ways. It's also quite tragic as well. And some of the other characters are quite, uh, they all sort of resent him in a way and sort of laugh at him and sort of stick their nose up at him because they're sort of like, oh, religion's way gone now. Yeah, it's quite it's quite bleak. Uh, it's like, imagine, because In Bruges, I, I keep comparing it to that, but that's got some really like hilarious moments combined with really quite sort of like sad and serious moments mm-hmm. the, the, the this isn't like laugh out loud funny it's just it's like quite like oh dear should i laugh at that like sort of thing and and then it's got some really sort of like dark themes and like really quite tragic moments uh would you describe the comedy as irreverent so irreverent is um comedy from a from a situation that is usually not laughed at so themes like from from what you've described it sounds like Martin McDonough's very good at it, but themes of suicide and abuse and horrible things like that, bringing comedy from those really dark situations, it sounds like a very sort of irreverent. I um, I've only seen like bits in the trailer. The trailer, the trailer is very very dramatic. But from what I saw, like there's like there is quite a few, as you mentioned, there is quite a few characters. How does the film manage all the characters, or are some like sidelined or 
something like no, that. No, because they it, it uses sort of the characters to show to sort of show the character of Father James himself, and like he's quite a nice person to be honest. He listens to everyone. Mm. But he sort of just gets laughed at quite a lot by a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention Chris O'Dowd's one of the characters in it as well. He plays a butcher and he he's quite a young guy who beats up his wife who's cheating on him with a black character. And they all sort of like, they all commit sins and they're all just quite quite nasty people really. And he's sort of like this some figure of like pleasantness. But they all just sort of look down on them really. It seems like race comes up a lot in Irish cinema. I, I was going to do the film The Guard, but I didn't. Um, well, this is, the film we're talking about is the same director who did The Guard. Oh, yeah. is it? It's Brendan yeah. Gleeson again, so there you go. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, Irish cinema seems to be focused a lot with race, and particularly, I think very honestly and very frank, uh, frankly, about how racist it has been in the past, like most nations have been. I think Irish cinema, I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit more in my film, but Irish cinema is very aware of its history and the wrongs it's done. And mm. it's willing to show that, I think, which is quite interesting. I think they're probably more honest and open about it than particularly we the English are. Mm, definitely. I think they are, they are open about more open about what they've done and the things they've done wrong and willing to show it yeah. and use that as a way to move on if that makes sense yeah it's really admirable that they don't hide from it or pretend it doesn't happen they address it and like move on from it which yeah i think there's lessons to be learned there for sure i was, I was going to ask about cavalry so this is a separate point um and you you mentioned this film's as sort of a mystery because he doesn't necessarily know who has basically said he, that they're going to kill him um how's that how's those elements in the film done are they done successfully is like the mystery like it's obviously this person or is there like some sort of twist nature to it what do you think but when i rewatched it like last week and obviously i know who it is it does it quite well it doesn't really you never really know who it's going to be at all mm. um there's a lot because a lot of the characters are quite just sort of quite disrespectful to him like i've said there are certain incidents where um some uh, like there's an incident where the well quite sort of halfway through the church gets burnt down and because uh, all the characters are sort of in one location at that point they're all in the pub i think it's like a friday maybe and um you sort of like oh who could it be and then like it does all these different like sort of shots of just showing each an individual character and it's kind of like could it be them could it be her could it be him so it keeps like the sort of mystery going as the film progresses, which is really good. It sounds like this film is almost, from coming from an angle where I haven't seen it, it sounds like this film almost has an anti-religious message, which is very interesting because obviously when you think of Irish cinema, you know, uh, religion, particularly Catholicism, of course, is so rooted in the national identity, national heritage. When you get a film that is suggesting from the way you've described it to almost be rejecting that, it's, it stands out. So, yeah, that was Calvary. Uh, really brilliant film. Definitely recommend it. There you go. It's Irish. Lovely. And we're talking about Irish cinema, so happy Pets and Factories Day. Happy Paddy's Day. Yeah, we'll drink our uh, Baileys to that. So sticking with the sombre theme that Noah just talked about, we're going to move into my film, which is The Magdalene Sisters. Um, it's a 2002 film. directed. It's directed by a Scottish man. So it's not an Irish director, but the subject matter is very Irish. So it's directed by Peter Mullen. Um, and the whole film is based upon um, true testimonies from different people. So it's I'll go into more depth into what the actual content is. But basically, the film was inspired um, and based on testimonies in the documentary um, sex in a cold climate. The film focuses on kind of like four main girls and we get the backstory of three of them and then we meet one in this asylum thing. So the Magdalene sisters basically looks at what life was like within the Magdalene asylums slash laundrettes. So they were like laundrettes but people were forced to go to them and it was basically slave labour essentially. Firstly we, f we follow Margaret who is raped by her cousin. And then the next day she's awoken really early and taken away um, because this is a huge disgrace and 
her father can't stand it. And then we get to Bernadette. Her only crime was being beautiful. Like, she's an orphan, and outside the orphanage, a couple of boys were flirting with her, and that was deemed wrong. And the reason why the sister explains that she's been put into the um, laundry slash asylum, whatever you want to call it, is because they wanted to take away the temptation for the boys. And then we have Rose, who is also referred to as Patricia, because when she arrives, they're like, we already have a Rose. Your name's Patricia. And they're like, and she's like, oh, okay. But basically, she's the classic unmarried mother. And then we also get um, Crispina, who's sort of a mentally disabled woman who's had this ch- who's had a child outside of marriage, and that's why she's there. Um, and these are true stories as well. So based on true testimonies from people. So the three main girls are played by obviously Irish actors, Nora Jane Nor, Dorothy Duffy, and Elizabeth Walsh Mullen. One of the former inmates. Um, her name's Mary Jo McDowell, said that the reality that was shown on the film was close to what actually happened, but it was actually in like 10 times worse, which is quite shocking because in the film you see them being like physically punished just for saying like, why am I here? It's quite harrowing. Um, Just to give you some fact, the actual history of it. So the Magdalene laundries flourished throughout the 1970s. They made a lot of money. These girls obviously got none of it. It's estimated about over 30 thousand victims and the last like shockingly the last one was closed in 1996 tell us um tell us about peter mullen's directorial style because most people who are familiar with peter mullen will be familiar with him yeah he will be familiar with him and trying to spot children of men it flows so nicely that you wouldn't really have imagined that it goes across like multiple years, which I think is something that's quite key within his rectal style. Like you can tell time is passing without it being mm. clunky, um, which I think is quite nice and definitely shown within this film. Just, just the whole subject matter of the film is treated with the respect that it needs. Because uh, like with a lot of films, sometimes they tackle difficult subject matters in a way which can come off as very pretentious and cheesy. And like in, in that way, it kind of comes off as like disrespectful to what they're talking about but yeah uh so it definitely sounds like this film avoids those traps completely see what you're saying and my next point was actually going to sort of back this up he definitely treats it with respect like the opening and the closing credits both have the names of all the victims really harrowing it's sort of like you know when you see war um victims on like walls and war memorials it's like Mm -hmm. that but for these women and i think that's so tasteful and shows how these women were real victims they literally did nothing wrong and they were put into slavery for no reason apart from you know being beautiful having a baby or being being raped it's a hard watch but it's a very relevant subject for example if you look at things like the film philomena that does it in a more light-hearted way and that's very much like more of a Hollywood studio y film. I have a question as well. Um, it's interesting, returning to my the topic I bring up a lot when we do these things, it's interesting that this film has a male director, but particularly when we live in this society where the director is obviously the auteur and like the guy we see, the, the guy, that's terrible, uh, the person we see is the driving force behind the film. How do you feel having a male voice being? basically the driving force behind this story which is such a a, a, f- a female experience a female mm-hmm. story i think that's a really interesting question and i think as someone who isn't a victim of that and what's gone through i think it would be in like it wouldn't do justice for me to be like oh i think that's really good or i think that's bad i think the film's good and i think the male voice doesn't necessarily come across but I think because it's not my story, I'm not a victim. I don't really have a say in that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I, you can just imagine, this film was obviously made um, about 20 years ago now, wasn't it? 2002? Yeah. Um, I think if this film was being made now, you would have people saying the exact same thing against Peter Mullen, uh, Mullen in a way. They'd be saying, well, why are you the man or the person's yeah. story? And I think I that's just, a- I think that's a valid criticism mm. of the film. I think it's a great film, but it, it I think it helps that it's based off a documentary as well. Sure. Um, because that gives it that factual layer. 
it's it does sound like as well that he's he's done his research taken the time told it with sensitivity and if that's the case and it's an accurate portrayal um if anything you said it was obviously toned down compared to what they dealt with i think it's it's potentially another argument f for the case of as long as you approach something with sensitivity yeah. and research anyone can tell any story uh, but it is it's such an interesting debate that there is no real answer for is there yeah. who's, Definitely who's agree. but in on this case obviously i wouldn't want to speak on anyone's behalf but there, there was extensive research done and based off the testimonies and i believe this person who's one of the testimonies is um, mary jo mcdowell i believe she sort of helped along the way as well and i think she did That's say it. that the film doesn't show 100 percent of the horrors but i don't think any film would because at the end of the day that's film film isn't is an entertainment art and you don't want to scare your audience off you did right it's a bridge between that telling the story accurately and not completely destroying your commercial viability yeah. um and the critics loved it you know critically it's amazingly well received yeah it was really well it. received yeah it, was, it had a lot of nominations for like all sorts of awards i can't tell you them off the top of my head but when i was looking it was nominated for a lot and i think it was done really really well yeah I, it's interesting because i'm not sure i would have gone to see it at the cinema i'm not yeah i, get but I definitely would watch it just i'm not sure you know, the cinema has a certain atmosphere to it and it's a day trip and this is quite a sad film. Mm. But I, yeah, I absolutely loved it and would recommend people watch it and immerse themselves in the history because I think it's so important, especially as we were talking about International Women's Day last week. It's so important that we know our history and that we know how to do better. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it on that one. <laughs> Well, it seems like a, a staple of Irish cinema is to not be particularly jolly. And we're going to continue that uh, with a bit of a different pick. We're going to jump back to 1992 with uh, director Neil Jordan and the film is The Crying Game. Renowned for its infamous plot twist, which I won't ruin. But no, this film starts off with a group of Northern Irish IRA members and they take a British, British soldier of course, played by renowned British actor Forrest Whitaker, who does a British <laughs> accent, debatably. Uh, he tried, he does his best. His acting is good, the accent. Mm. And basically, our main character is played by Stephen Rear, who is a fantastic actor. You might have seen him in V for Vendetta, for example. And he builds a relationship with this British soldier who he basically knows that he's going to have to kill at some point. And then that story unfolds. And then after about half an hour, after the first act, the story kind of evolves into something else. We get a bit of a time jump. Uh, we follow Stephen Rear's character and we follow him as he basically, trying to say this without spoiling anything, he, he basically delves deeper into the British soldier's life back home. But unfortunately for him, just as he's just about getting settled, uh, his old IRA unit basically catch up with him. And then we get back into that one more, one last job kind of thing that crops up a lot. This film, I like it. I think it's tense. I think it's really sensitive. I think it deals with um, themes that a lot of films wouldn't touch for probably another 20 years. Uh, I think it's ahead of its time in that respect. I think it's well directed. I think it's generally well acted. Yeah, it's, it's a hidden gem, I would say. If you want to avoid spoilers, jump to the quiz section. So the British soldier, Jodie, he, he tells Stephen Rear's character to go and find his girlfriend and like look after her or something. Uh, and she has a secret of her own she, she's trans yeah but um yeah no she's she she is a she's a bloke she's jay davidson the actor who was also Ra in star trek the movie uh there you go who who had his own history of uh struggling with gender identity and his own sexuality which plagued him his whole life he's still alive he's not dead so. yeah i think the film you were talking about how uh the subject matters or whatever would be difficult and actually the film really struggled to be like financed due to like the sex the sexuality and the gender struggles in it it was a really hard pitch from uh neil jordan but yeah it was really hard to finance and but you, that doesn't come across it comes across so well and i i think it it makes absolutely the most of its budget it's it still managed to get a fantastic cast i think probably at the time they they weren't famous uh, it's yeah. got jim Broadbent in it in one of his earliest roles 
of Hot Fuzz fame. Uh, saw James perk up at that one. Adrian, Adrian Dunbar, who is Line of Duty royalty. For me, the film feels like it's two films in one. So the first yeah. half an hour feels like it's a short film. And then the second bit feels like it's the main part of the film, like a continuation of, from the short. It feels like it's two separate films that have the same characters, um, which I think is really interesting. Because the first, the, <laughs> I love the characters in it. And especially in the first half, um, the relationship between Fergus and the soldier is so bizarre. Like you kind of forget that he's the prisoner and then someone from the IRA will come in and be like, Fergus, what are you doing? Put the hood on and slap the soldier or whatever. And it's like when Fergus is laughing at something the soldier said and one of the guys walks in and they're like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, it's just funny. And he's like, oh, can I speak to you outside? And Fergus goes, oh, I'll be back in a minute, mate. It's like, what? It's yeah. so bizarre. I'm sure there's... <laughs> There's a line at one point where he's like, oh, he's all right, really. Or, you know, yeah. <laughs> phrase like that. But, he, you know, I think, and I think their bond is realistic. I think it it feels genuine, which is a testament to the chemistry of the two actors here. Which you... I think it's a good display of the confusion between the Irish and the British. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, he realises they're all the same, doesn't he? Pretty much. Uh, there's, I think potentially uh, controversial. I think there's definitely some homoerotic undertones between the two as well. I thought uh, it was. I, I thought it was a um, going to be a love story between the two of them, to be honest with you. I, that would have been a great film. I and then, watched... then it was Twist, and then it was Twist 2. Yeah. <laughs> it's the 26th greatest British film of all time, according to the BFI. Uh, now now for, some, for some Jimmy fun facts. There are some alternate endings to this film. Is I think we'll agree that maybe the ending isn't the strongest bit of this film. So the female member of his uh, IRA unit catches up with him in his path. She's she's going to kill him, but uh, luckily Dill uh, little Dill pickle goes. <laughs> yeah, she, she she like mows her down, doesn't she? Were you um, there when my Jody was dying? Were you there? <laughs> and um, and Fergus says, uh, he's, he's like, Dill, one of us is going to have to take the rap for this. Uh, so he does. It's, so, he goes like, it's so weird because he, she then goes and visits him in prison and she's like, you've yeah. done that for me, I'm so excited. And he's just like, don't call me darling, don't call me hun. And it's like, he doesn't really like, like her or love her at all. And she's just like counting down the days till he's out. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't get that dynamic at the end. But does tell her the story that Jodie told him of the scorpion and the frog. Yeah, in my nature. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, ending, not the best bit of this film. However, uh, I think there's two alternative endings. In one, you know the um, the horrible man who's been in a relationship with Dill? David. Yeah, David. Uh, <laughs> he like accidentally turns up at their house at the end and gets arrested for the murder of that woman. Oh, so they both go off. Yeah. So they both just go off scot free. And I can't remember what the other one was. I think I did this the other week with uh, 28 Days Later as well. But, uh, you know, let us know in the comments below. But um, <laughs> I'll wrap this up. Look, uh, if, if you like your shocks, your surprises, you want something a bit different, definitely give the crying game a go. Uh, it's got, yeah, great cast, good writing, good solid, tense direction. Um, and it's it's ahead of its time. It's it's the way it deals with gender politics is it might show its age a little bit now, but you know, bear in mind it's nineteen ninety. It's just out of the eighties. It's it's got a, a really strong message to say. Which means we're now onto our game, hosted by this this month's tiebreak tie king. So it's history of Ireland, you mate. Five questions about Ireland. Multiple answers are three in total. Question one. What Dublin brewery opened in 1759? Was it one, Heineken, two, Guinness, three, Corona? So we've uh, all gone with number two being Guinness. Yes. Yep. Of course it is. There we go. Question two. What crop failed in, oh, it's meant to say in the 1840s, causing the Great Irish Famine? Potato, corn, wheat. On a 
Yeah. We've all gone with number one, which is potatoes. Potatoes. You will be correct, of course. Oh, oh Lord. Something like two million died, didn't they, as a result? All right, we're all, we're all on the same score so far. I hope they can call that. <laughs> Emma's going to have a meltdown. What famous <laughs> ocean liner was christened in Belfast in... I can't see the year because my face is... 1911. Was it the Costa Concordia, Titanic, or the M33? Ah, uh, the M33, the famous liner. <laughs> <laughs> it was, of course, Titanic. So that's another three points all round. How many caps does former Republic of Ireland captain Roy Keane have? I know none of you really like football, so this should be fun. Is it 1, 76, 2, 26, 3, 67? None of these are an acceptable amount of caps to have. What is a caps, cap? Caps being appearances in international football. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, I thought you said I thought you said cat, as in meow. No, it, it says it right that's up there. Breed, Jimmy, for goodness that's sake. why I said that's not an acceptable amount of cats to have. I was confused also. That 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 makes right. a lot more sense. And it says it right there, caps. I know. I read it. All right, you've all gone with three, and you're all bloody right. <laughs> <laughs> Question five. What is the population of the city of Dublin? Now, just for people out there, this was a stat from 2016, and it's just the city of Dublin, not the great area. You know what? <gasps> Two, Emma's gone one, Jimmy's gone three. The correct answer is... <gasps> Jimmy with... <laughs> Obviously, it might have gone up in those five years, but that's what I had written down. I've been to Dublin a few times. Yeah, it looks like a lovely shitty. Let's pitch around, and there's five pictures of edited Irish film stars, and you just have to tell me who they are. Can you tell me who this is? Buzz! <laughs> Jimmy. Uh, I think it might be Colin Farrell. Is it Colin Farrell? Uh, who is this? Buzz. Oh, uh, James. Is it Killian Murphy? Is it Killian Murphy? It is. Question eight. Who's there? Jimmy? Uh, no. Sorry, I, I push no. you for time here, Jimmy. No, I've got no clue. Sorry, I don't know why I said Buzz. James, Emma? Oh, I'd, I'd be, oh, come on, you must know. I'm guessing with, with, with a made up name, this is just. I, I don't know, unfortunately. No one knows. No. Nope. You're all going to be kicking yourself. Oh, wait, no, Buzz, Buzz, Buzz! No! no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no! It's. Um, no, Sasha I, I know, I know! It's <laughs> Sasha Ronan, isn't it? It's Sasha oh. Ronan. <laughs> Question nine. But, uh, Buzz! Buzz! Jimmy. Dom Hall Gleason. Damn it. Right. That is a shocking haircut. Yeah, like, it's <laughs> it really is. I thought I'd go with one with him over a bad haircut like that just to throw you off. The final picture out. A uh, question. Buzz. Buzz. <laughs> James. Is it Chris O'Dowd? Of course I'm not it is. Yeah. Anything, to be honest, it makes me. I'm laughing too much. I'm not like buzzing. <laughs> Do you not like the edits? The edits are good. Oh, that's I'm... Right. I'm loving them. That's what I'm saying. And yeah, so this is. Uh, I'll show you some scrambled letters, and the letters make up an Irish actor, actress, director. And you just need to tell me what the Irish person's name is. Let's kick it off. Buzz. Which Irish actor is that? James. Is it Brendan Gleeson? Oh, yes. Straight in good. there. Well done. Brendan Gleeson. Well you done. I thought that as well. I didn't say it. Right, question 12. Come on, Emma. <laughs> Got to catch up with the boys. Buzz? James? Is, is it Fiona Shaw? If you, if you get that. No! 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 I was thinking I... it was Sasha someone. I saw Fiona Shaw and I said, I've got no idea who that is. 
She was an actress in the Harry Potter films, I do believe. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. I love Harry Potter. 13. Ready? Oh, okay. That's interesting. Uh, what, what names can I make with that? Um, <laughs> a ha hag count. No. No. Okay. I'll give you five, four, three. Greta Thunberg. Two, one. Greta Thunberg. No one got that? No. Kenneth Branagh. Oh, that's a good one. That's good. There he is. Yeah. Is he Irish? Technically Northern Irish, but... Oh, James is still in the lead by one. Pressure's on Jimmy. But a buzz. Jimmy. I've got to go for it. Jessica Billock. <laughs> no. No way. <laughs> oh, okay. Is this the K again? The, like, it's an actress. Is it an actress? From oh. Chernobyl. Five, four, three, two, one. Does uh, Emma? You, you looked that up. <laughs> Emma definitely looked that up. She was looking down at something. Hey, that's cheeky. Jesse Blakely. It's Jesse Buckley. Buckley. <laughs> you still got it wrong. <laughs> I thought it was Jessie. I, I saw the Jess in there and I was like... There she is. Right, I got Jessie all by myself. Is, so, uh, Jimmy been... needs to get this right to get it to a, a tiebreaker, which I'll then oh, have to come up I, with a... I love it. Yeah. You love it when you was your Jimmy. James, you just need to get it right. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see about that. Ready? Go on. Oh, buzz, buzz, buzz. James. Um, Michael Fassbender. No! <laughs> yeah, okay. He's Irish as well. Yeah, he's... he's there he up. is. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> Look at my... No tiebreak this week. Finally, there's a winner with no tiebreak. Right. Well done, James. You've won my Irish quiz. Great. Quite comfortably as well. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy really lost it towards the end there. Yeah, so like we're month two now. So our first month's winner was Jimmy, and our second month's winner is Noah. Um, I still have not won a single game this month. <laughs> Noah won all, th all, all three games, and James won one game. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, that there, there is another episode uh, done and dusted. I, I won the quiz, but I, uh, I lost the uh, the overall war. Mr. Noah uh, takes it this month, and uh, I guess we'll have to see what next month has in store for these quizzes. So uh, thank you very much for watching. We've been Four Struggling Filmmakers. You continue to stay safe. We'll continue to struggle. Yeah, and that's it. Happy St. Paddy's Day, guys. Happy St. Paddy's Day. <laughs> see you later, Boris. Uh, it's my emergency Guinness for an occasion such as St. Patrick's Day. Does the does it have the weird thing in it? You mean the widget? Yeah. One of my yeah. relatives invented. Your relatives did not invent it, Jimmy. No, legitimately, my uh, my cousin's granddad invented the widget, and he also invented colouring toothpaste.